Thank you, all of you who have joined me this evening for this uh, uh, continuing series of uh, webinars on prophecy and preparedness. Appreciate all of you being here. Um, uh, we've been talking about, in some of the other webinars I did, the idea that there are three levels of preparedness. So we're going to kind of address that in the way we talk about the topic tonight. There's the preparedness for natural disasters or local emergencies where you need some basic supplies to get you through till rescue comes. And then there's preparation for, you know, widespread disasters, uh, such as economic or social collapse. Uh, and there's also preparation for, you know, kind of the doomsday scenario uh, that civilization completely falls apart. So, you know, I, um, I think uh, kind of with food, when it comes to food storage, uh, you really can't prepare for the, for doomsday, but but why food storage is important is because number one, there's a high likelihood that most of us at one time or another will be involved in some kind of natural disaster, um, albeit floods or fires or tornadoes or hurricanes or uh, earthquakes, uh, whatever or uh, more long-term disasters such as droughts or crop failures that create food shortages and so forth. But, but that's not the only reason to store food. Having food storage is a really good uh, buffer for personal crises that you might have. So for example, you suddenly find yourself unemployed or you have a sudden financial setback. You have some food to fall back on. Now, I realize that the government gives out food stamps and everything, but I, I prefer to kind of have, take a self-reliant attitude of not being dependent on the government, but depending on myself, which is one of the things I really want to stress this evening is the whole idea of self-reliance. And then there's also man-made disasters, uh, such as war. Uh, you know, war is a major man-made disaster, and wars will definitely cause food shortages or or riots, or, or major power outages, or a collapse of the government, or um, so forth. Um, so having food storage is really helpful for all of these kinds of scenarios. The, the question, when I say, could it happen here, um, the, uh, in Cody Lundin's uh, book, uh, When All Hell Breaks Loose, which is about um, urban survival, he, he talks about how, um, you know, one of the chapters is, is food storage, and he, he gives a whole series of scenarios that have happened in, in, in recent times. Um, uh, the, for instance, there was a famine in the Soviet Union in the, between 1932 and 1934, and um, the, what happened in that famine is, is basically the, so many people were starving that, you know, they basically started trafficking in, in eating human beings and, and so forth, which is not the first time this happened. This is in modern times that this happened. And uh, no one knows how many people actually starved to death because of the, you know, lack of records for the Soviets, but the estimates are between 5 to 8 million people uh, about 10 to 25 percent of the population of the Ukraine starved during that period of time. Um, the, the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto in the beginning of World War II, uh, basically uh, numerous of them also starved. In China, between 1958 and 1962, uh, Chairman Mao Zedong, in his efforts to industrialize the nation, uh, Basically, in the way he, his policies did, it basically created this widespread uh, chaos that uh, caused 30 million people to die by starvation. And again, many people resorted to cannibalism, and a lot of people in those things eat, eat just about anything. In uh, Biafra, a civil war caused a famine that killed 1 million people and uh, leaving 3.5 to suffer from malnutrition. North Korea, as, as recently as 1994 to 98, due to um, reduced Chinese and Russian subsidies, along with problems with the farming caused by flooding, drought, and government corruption, 
it was estimated that about two to three million people died of starvation uh, and disease. Uh, the point is, is that it could happen here, and especially with what um, uh, is going on in our government and our, our economy. I recently saw a little uh, video that helped me understand a little bit why our economy is still holding together in spite of the fact that we're uh, deficit spending like crazy. And the answer is because we have been, for the last 50 years, the world's reserve currency. And what that means is, is that trade, international trade between most countries uh, in the world is carried on in U.S. dollars. So countries have needed U.S. dollars in order to facilitate foreign trade. The, f the fact that U.S. dollars have been the primary currency for foreign trade for 50 years has meant that other countries want, want, wanted U.S. dollars, which means our government and the Federal Reserve could recklessly print more money and create more and more debt uh, because other countries would gladly accept this money from us to help them engage in foreign trade. Well, that's starting to collapse, uh, and very shortly the, uh, the world will probably stop using the dollar as the world's reserve currency, and when it does, um, we will no longer be able to buy cheap goods from China and Mexico and other countries because um, it, the, our dollar will no longer be accepted uh, as in, uh, a world trading currency, and so all of our ability to buy cheap oil and other things from other countries will collapse. And that right there could initiate, you know, a widespread uh, uh, chaos and food, food. And this could be as little as a year or two from now that that happens. So I, I want to talk about food storage as a way of life. Um, not as just something to think about as emergency preparedness, but as uh, actually a way of uh, of living. To me, food storage is a way of living. I've I grew up in a family that that stored food. We had a a basement, um, and in the basement there were always these big. Uh, they weren't fifty five gallon drums. They were, but they were uh, metal containers about the size of a fifty five gallon drum that were full of wheat. We had honey. We had cupboards full of uh, canned goods and and home bottled goods. And so, like I, when I was young, uh, needed a bottle of ketchup, I'd go down to the or mayonnaise. I'd go down to the basement and get one. And my mom was buying stuff on sale and putting it there in storage. And then we would kind of rotate it through. So I kind of have done that my whole adult life. I, I did. Uh, because I've been divorced a couple of times and, and lost a lot of my preparations. Um, I, I don't have as much, you know, food storage as I'd like, but I, I, I do, you know, store food. I, I've always stored food. I've always had some kind of food reserve on hand. I've always had a well-stocked pantry. And so uh, because of this, I have, you know, have quite a bit of practical experience in this. So what I'm proposing is that you look at this as a three-stage plan. Um, if you haven't actually started to store food, then you want to concentrate on each step in order uh, to take care of the most important priorities first and then gradually build up to the um, final thing. So phase one would be emergency preparedness, and that is to at least make sure that you have an emergency three-day survival kit with food and water for three days and enough food on hand to feed your entire family for two to four weeks. Uh, that's, that's the minimum that you should do, and that's actually pretty easy for most anybody to do. Um, if you, uh, you know, uh, do some things we're going to talk about. Phase two would be to obtain uh, at least about a year's supply of food. Um, Maybe if you can't do a year, get six months. Um, but you're gonna, we're going to talk about basic survival foods, uh, which are not going to be the kind of things that you, uh, you know, are going to be in the frozen food and can section. And you're gonna, so you're going to have to learn how to cook and eat them. And I would also suggest creating a food cache, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And then 
as you're doing that, then I would also start developing into this food storage as a way of life thing that I do, which is, is you know, learning how to preserve your own food through canning, drying, freezing, fermenting, whatever, and, um, and basically, uh, you know, buy things when they're in season and, and preserve them, uh, grow a garden if you have space for one, um, and store heirloom seeds whether you have a garden or not, and also learn edible uh, wild plants and practice eating them. Uh, we're going to talk about why that's important and also learning how to hunt or trap animals for food uh, as well. So let's start off with the phase one of our emergency preparedness, which, um, I mean, we, we've had several, you know, um, examples of why this is important just in our own country in recent times. Hurricane Katrina uh, hitting uh, the um, Louisiana area, uh, the Hurricane Sandy hitting the East Coast, uh, tornadoes in the Midwest, the possibility of, of, of earthquakes and so forth. And, you know, with, with Hurricane Sandy, I mean, many people, you know, out without power for, for several weeks, uh, rationing of supplies, rationing of gas, that sort of thing. You know, how nice is it to know that at least, you know, while you're waiting, for you know things to start coming back to normal that you at least don't have to worry about feeding your family. I mean that's what this is all about. So the goal of this phase is to obtain food and supplies to see you through a short-term crisis that should include two things. One is you may have to evacuate and if you have to evacuate you want to be able to grab something that you're going to take with you that will have a three-day supply of food that you can, if necessary, carry out on foot because because if you cannot, you know, evacuate in a car. And then if you're stranded at home, then you can also look at having two to four weeks of food, water, and other supplies to tide you over until relief comes. So there's your there's your two goals. Okay. So the first thing is to develop your bug out kit. So you get a a, a small backpack um, that uh, and stock it with a three-day supply of food and water um, plus other supplies for keeping warm uh, treating my injuries and I would include cash some money is cash okay because if the powers out and you've got to run and grab something the ATM machines are not going to work the the swiping machines at the uh, stores aren't going to work, and if you have some cash, you may be able to to negotiate or barter for things you need. Now, I made um, I made bug out kit for both of my kids who live in the Los Angeles area uh, because I wanted them to have at least the 72 hour supply, and I'm making one um, for my daughter who uh, is with her mom right now, but is going to go back to college. Um, soon so I want her to have one as well and this is the the kit I'm putting together for my daughter um, what I did is I, I bought from a, uh, a, a place called emergency essentials a 72 hour kit that has water in little foil pouches and also has MRI uh, meals that's military rations and, and the military rations come with a warmer pack which is something that's like it's it's like those little things that you you break something and it lights up you basically you you um, do something I can't remember exactly how how it works but it it turns this little thing into a warming pad which you can wrap around the MRE and and heat it up so they were in um, all these little military boxes so I took everything out of the boxes. And I organize them into packs. So that's one, two, three days worth of food. And inside of each of those bags is three meals with water and everything organized for that particular meal. So you can just, they could just pull the, the pouch out for the breakfast or the lunch or the dinner. And it, there's, there's a pouch of water in there. There, there's, uh, you know, um, the, the MRE meals and some other snacks and things. 
as well as I have included some uh, uh, high calorie energy bars and other things, uh, including I stuck in some uh, packs of like the Nature Sunshine Solstick uh, 24, like instant vitamin mineral kind of things, and some uh, emergency, uh, the powdered vitamin C fizzy drink uh, for them as well to, to stay healthy. Um, I also, with that, uh, put in a, a bunch of other supplies. I put in things to basically uh, uh, provide shelter from the elements to keep you warm or shade you from the sun or so forth. Things to uh, protect them from the elements, so like sunscreen, insect repellent, and a dust mask in case there, there's some kind of pollutants in the air. I got some dust masks that have like carbon uh, carbon in them, so they actually will help filter out uh, toxic impurities. I have first aid supplies. I have stuff to start fires with. I have some tools in there, and of course, I have cash. And I, like I said, I gave this to my kids, and I also instructed them to put in there uh, some items of their own. So uh, these are the supplies. This, this is actually um, uh, I also gave my kids a uh, a little. A printout of everything that was in the kit with instructions on what to do for uh, an emergency and uh, and what everything in the kit is for. So this is actually right out of the instruction manual for my kits. I, I put in silver shield um, because uh, I, and with instructions that this will kill pathological bacteria. If there's any kind of sickness or plague going around to take at least three tablespoons three times a day. In the event of an emergency, one tablespoon uh, it can be used to uh, three times daily to avoid catching infections. It can also be used to purify water. Add one teaspoon per quart and wait 30 minutes. So uh, I put that in for that. I also put in Silver Shield Gel, which basically can be applied topically uh, to basically if a to wounds to prevent them from becoming infected. It can be squeezed right in the wounds, and it also can be used as hand sanitizer uh, when sanitary cushions aren't good. Also, I put in high-potency garlic because that's one of my favorite things for fighting infection. I told them to take that along with Silver Shield if there's sickness going around. Um, and an iodine tincture for disinfecting water and also for for wounds. And I also put in a thing of iodorol. Uh, after the um, the nuclear thing that took disaster that took place in Japan, I'm concerned that if like there was an earthquake down in uh, California, there are a lot of the power plants, the nuclear power plants are along the fault lines. And it's very possible that there could be a nuclear disaster. Um, and so I would want them to start taking iodine every day to protect their thyroid from uh, radiation. I put in an herbal formula for pain. Um, I also put in some Typhoo oil, which is one of my, and peppermint oil, which are two of my favorite little first aid items with a list of some of the things you can do with those. H homeopathic Arnica, which is one of my favorite treatments for sprains and strains and so forth. Uh, I put in some ACE bandages, some first aid tape, assorted bandages and gauze tape for for taking care of injuries. And then I also put in uh, a, a tarp so that they could, you could pitch a tarp. Uh, you can use it as a ground cover or pitch it as a tent because I've got some cord, 100 feet of, of uh, parachute cord in there. So you can pitch the tarp as a tent. Um, a wool blanket because wool will keep you warm even if it gets wet. Um, a thermal blanket and an emergency uh, blanket, uh, which basically are one is uh, the really thin uh, emergency blanket. The other one's a thicker one, but they can be used to reflect heat or wrap around you. Uh, I put in an emergency poncho, uh, fire starting kit with a bunch of things that can basically be used to start fires. Plastic trash bags, which are really good not only for trash, but also can be used like an emergency poncho by, by poking some holes in them for your arms and your uh, head. I also bought um, from the emergency thing, a, I found these really cool little things. They're uh, wind up, uh, uh, have their built-in little generator that you can wind up to recharge it that basically 
uh, is a f little radio and a flashlight, and it has a thing that you can attach to recharge your cell phone. So in an emergency, um, you could use this wind-up thing to get a little charge on your cell phone. Um, I put in antiseptic wipes so that they could clean their hands before eating or dressing injuries. Uh, mini packs of tissues, you know, like the little mini mini packs of Kleenex, which I thought was an easier thing to put in than trying to put in toilet paper. Um, the masks that have the activated charcoal, a bandana, which could also be used as a mask or to shelter your head or to put around your thing or to make a sling, uh, sunblock. I put a pencil and wrap duct tape around it so that they would have a little bit of duct tape uh, to use for fixing things and, of course, the cash. So, um, and then I have some of the other things like there's a, uh, a knife, a uh, multi-tool so that you have a screwdriver, um, pliers, and some of those other tools to like fix things in an emergency, that sort of thing. Like whatever you're doing for food for the emergency kit, you don't, if, if you don't want to like do what I did and buy the MRIs or MI, military ra uh, rations, you, you still want things that you're not going to have to cook. You don't, you don't know that you're going to have power. You don't know if you're going to be able to build a fire. You don't know what you're going to be, be at. So for your 72-hour kit, the food that you want in there, you, sh you should be able to eat without cooking and eat without rehydrating um, because you don't know what the water situation will be. So basically, you want something that you can just eat. So besides some of the MREs, they, they have like tuna and other things in these foil pouches now, which are really easy to open, uh, 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 and, and tuna and sardines and everything are very, you know, high, highly nutritious uh, foods that are going to supply a lot of calorie. Um, you know, energy bars, uh, even some candy, uh, the hard, like hard candies that you could suck on for just a little quick energy, uh, crackers. Uh, nut butters and honey. Um, these are also things I like to take hiking. So I I have some of these things on hand, and I rotate them by eating them when I go hiking and then replacing them. And then nuts and dried fruits, like trail mix kind of thing, you know. But obviously, if you're going to have some trail mix, you definitely want to rotate that. You don't want to just stick it in a kit and forget it. You're going to have to take it out and replace it periodically. Um, the military rations will be good for several years if they're not in too hot of a situation. Um, the kits I made for my son and I in our cars, uh, I probably need to pull the military rations out and replace them with, because they're in the car and it's hot. And uh, so it, it, I, I, it's been a little over a year and it's time to, to replace them. Okay, so that's... That's your bug out kit. Your bug out kit is this is this thing that you have so that if you had to evacuate your home on short notice because there's a storm coming or there's an earthquake or a situation where things suddenly become unsafe and you got to get out and get out now, you grab that and you can leave and go and you've got some basic supplies to, to uh, tide you over. Now, in, in a lot of cases, you might wind up, you know, being in a situation where uh, there's an earthquake or a storm or whatever, and and you know the grocery stores are shut down. It, may, it takes a while for disaster relief people to come in, so you want to have some supplies on hand to tide your family over until relief can come. So um, you 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 want to stock your pantry now. Um, all what you want to do in stocking your pantry is just buy more of what you eat all the time. So like, for example, I have, uh, I like the Pacific uh, tomato soup. So I always have several boxes of it on hand. And as I eat a box, I put on my shopping list to replace it and I buy a new one. So basically what I do is I look, I look for it when it, for things when they're on sale and buy two or three of them, stock the pantry and then try to replace, re, you know, keep a list that I can write on when I use something up to replace it. Um, that way I can always have a fairly well-stocked pantry of foods that I'm eating all the time. They're not going to go bad because I'm rotating them and, and using them constantly. 
And basically, um, so I'm, I'm really confident that if everything went crazy, uh, at least for, you know, a month, I could eat pretty good and have a lot of variety in the food that I eat because, you know, have a very well-stocked pantry. I'd just be eating out of my pantry. Um, so that's phase one. That, and I think, like I say, I think anybody can do phase one. Um, it, it did cost me about, um, it's cost me about $350 per kit to put together the bug out kits. But, you know, I, I, the food in them, the MR, uh, MREs, uh, is about, was about $110, I think, or something like that, about $100. And that included all the, the foil packs of water and everything. And then, of course, I have a nice knife in there. I have a multi-tool, which is 30 bucks, and I have a flashlight, and I have the charger, which is 30 bucks. So, you know, a lot of the cost of it is in the pack and some of the other little things that I bought to include in there. But um, if you didn't use some of those things, you could put together a bug-out kit very easily for around $100, $150, at least with some basic supplies. Um, now we're going to shift over to long-term food storage, which is what you'd need if, if you're faced with a situation where there's a breakdown and relief is not going to be coming anytime soon. So the goal here is to obtain food and supplies to see you through a long-term crisis, such as a long period of unemployment, a collapse of the economy, or a breakdown of the social structure or, or government system that basically caused a, a long-term situation. The goal here is to have a one-year supply of basic nutrition for everybody in your family. Now, the, the government has plans, and I should be very upfront about this, that they call people who store food hoarders, not people who are smart and, and prepared, but they call them hoarders. The government may want to confiscate your food storage, and neighbors might want to steal it. Um, I so or or gangs or whatever. So I would consider making some caches. Um, that is hiding at least part of this food, um, so that if someone broke into your house or the government came in, uh, that that they'd take they'd be able to take part of it, but they wouldn't be able to take all of it. Um, all right, so nasty little business, but, you know, just having a, a supply of food isn't going to guarantee that somebody isn't going to, like, you know, want to take it away from you. Okay, some basic rules of, of food storage um, in general. Don't store anything your family isn't going to eat, okay? The reason why is because you won't be able to rotate it. It'll go bad, and you'll have to throw it out, and... Um, when you're storing it, make sure you use only food-grade storage containers. Do not just use any container. Make sure that the containers you're storing your food in are designed to store food so that they haven't had any kind of chemicals or whatever in, the, in them that would contaminate the food. Food is going to store best if you can keep it cool, away from light, away from moisture, and away from oxygen. Um, I, like I mentioned in, um, the house I grew up in, there was a basement and it was kind of an unfinished basement. So it actually had, uh, it was a little bit cooler down there, uh, because when, when you have, uh, get a certain number of feet below the earth and it depends on where you live, but usually at least three feet under the ground, the temperature stays a pretty constant 50 degrees. So. If you've got a basement and you've got a part of the basement that's not insulated, um, then you have a, a really nice place to store food. In one house that I lived in, there was a part of the basement that was unfinished, and I basically uh, built a wall and sheetrocked it and insulated it and put in a door and created a cold storage room in the basement that basically the the, so the wall to the outside of the house was not insulated, but the wall separating that from the rest of the basement was was very heavily insulated, and it stayed nice and cool in there and kept my food storage. Where I live right now, I don't have a basement, 
and I have a little bit of frustration with that because um, the the it gets really hot in the summer and heat really lowers life of feed storage. I really want to dig a root cellar, so I'm hoping at some point to be able to go out and dig a root cellar. Uh, however, I do have a neighbor who has a root cellar. So worst case scenario, I would transfer all my food into his root cellar. Um, but right now I have it stored in one of the rooms in my house, which I, I actually try to keep a little cooler than the rest of the house and, and keep kind of dark. Plus you're going to keep it in, in airtight containers and, and watertight containers so that it's protected from the element. You're going to, you, you're going to want to rotate what you store, which means you're going to want to use it and replace it. Um, and so, especially with canned or bottled foods, you want to try to use them up within two years. How much you need to store depends on how many people are in your family, the age, height, uh, uh, I should actually say uh, age, height, weight, and sex of each member of the family. Because um, men generally consume, need more calories than women do. Uh, obviously, you're, you know, you've got teenage kids that they need more calories than uh, an older person. Uh, also, a bigger person needs more calories than a smaller person. Plus, you want to think about the level of activity that's going to be sustained. You can survive on a minimal amount of calories if you're not going to be doing very much, but if you're going to have to be working or whatever, you're going to need more calories. But you also have to consider how much space do you have available to, to store the food and what are the conditions for your storage space, you know, because you don't want to store a bunch of stuff that's just going to go bad because you didn't have a good place to store it. So I found this table and I converted it to kind of show you how much this is from a calories per day to a calories per year. Um, <clears throat> but you can see that uh, 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 even just a two to three year old child needs about a thousand calories a day, which is 365,000 cal calories a year. Uh, a four to eight child that goes up by about 300 calories a day. Um, and then you start to see the difference between the girls and the boys. Uh, Nine to 13 year old boys need a little more calories on average than girls. Remember, this is kind of averaging everything as far as you know height and weight. Um, uh, your biggest calorie intake runs with uh, 14 to 18 year old boys and 19 to 30 year old men, and also uh, a similar thing with, with women. Uh, and then your calorie needs start to decline as you get a little older because you're not quite as, your metabolism isn't quite as high. So um, that's just kind of some information for calculating that out. Um, now, you can go to these like emergency preparedness um, places, like uh, the emergency essentials where I've bought some of my supplies, and they'll sell you your supply of food for, you know, one person or you know uh, or you can buy it for a family of two or three or four or whatever all packed in these kind of uh, cans these number 10 cans with things like uh, and and they'll have all kinds of things in there um, uh, peas and lentils and powdered milk and um, dehydrated fruits and dehydrated vegetables and and dehydrated soups and and all all sorts of, of stuff. I don't buy very much of that stuff because I don't want to eat dehydrated fruits and vegetables all the time. Um, and again, even though this stuff will store for 25 years, um, I I don't want to like have a lot of stuff around that I'm not going to be able to rotate and use. So I don't really you know buy this. Plus, this is a little more expensive way to do food storage. Um, well, actually, the way I'm doing it is, is in some ways more expensive, but I'm also buying organic uh, produce, which the stuff that they sell in these cans isn't organic. So, um, But if you have more money than time and you have the money to plop down, you can just go ahead and order 
boom, and it'll all come in these nice nice uh, cases and boxes that are stackable and and so forth, and you just have to put it away, uh, and it'll be good for about 25 years. Um, a, not, uh, a more basic food storage that is going to be quite a bit cheaper, but not as, um, uh, how do you say it, um, not as, as versatile and tasty in so many ways, is the Mormon 4. This was a concept felt by the Mormons that of, of some foods that actually keep quite well for a long period of time that have a lot of nutrition in them. And so they came up with the idea of having whole wheat about 200 to 365 pounds per person per year. Obviously, that depends a little on age. Um, wheat that is packed into buckets that have nitrogen in them will last virtually indefinitely. Wheat that's just packed in plain old buckets, period, uh, will last pretty much indefinitely at least 20 or 30 years um, if you don't put it in the heat. Um, it would still be edible even if it's in the heat. It just loses nutritional value. Um, you, they also recommend powdered milk, uh, 60 to 100 pounds per person per year. That will keep one to five years. And honey or sugar, of course, I think honey is a better thing to store. It's uh, more nutritional. More, more nutritious and better for you, 35 to 100 pounds per person per year. And honey will keep for virtually forever. You know, if you stick honey in a closed container, it can last for hundreds of years. Um, and salt. You want to store salt. Salt is really important. Um, salt is important for preserving food. Salt is important for seasoning food. Um, and so, you again, salt will keep indefinitely. I don't drink powdered milk, and I, since you'd have to rotate it, and since I've never wanted to to drink powdered milk, I've never uh, stored powdered milk. I have stored wheat, um, but my problem is is that I have developed somewhat of a gluten intolerance, and so I decided that, you know, storing wheat isn't, like, the best thing. So what I've done as my modification of the Mormon 4 is this. Um, I basically decided to store a variety of grains. Uh, so what I've done is I went to the local uh, health food store, Natural Grocers, and I asked to see their bulk food list. And basically, I can custom order uh, bags of like you know 25 pounds or 50 pounds of this or that or the other. So I've been going and, and periodically ordering. Uh, organic spelt corn. Uh, I bought white rice from Costco. I ordered my organic brown rice from uh, the store. I also bought millet and quinoa and amaranth. So I, I basically picked a variety of grains. I, I found that quinoa and amaranth actually store about as, as well as wheat. Um, brown rice actually is the one grain that basically is has a limited shelf life. It'll only keep one to two years before it starts to go rancid. So fortunately, I like brown rice, so I can rotate my brown rice quite well. Uh, Cody Lundin says he got some brown rice that, that was a little bit rancid, and he ate it anyway. And uh, aside from a little bit of, of indigestion, it was fine. Um, <laughs> but... But all the rest of these grains should keep for 10 to 12 years in sealed containers. Um, I'll sh show you a little bit about containers in a minute. Um, and then instead of powdered milk, since I know that uh, legumes complement grains as far as protein goes, I also store a variety of legumes. Um, some beans, like I've got pinto beans and as Anasazi beans, and I've got whole peas, and I've got split peas, and I've got lentils. Um, and I am doing 150 pounds per person per year for my storage. I'm trying to store enough for myself and uh, my son David and also my other kids if they happen to have to come and live with me. And I'm also looking at honey, and I bought sucanat. Um, I, I ordered 
I could get a 50 pound bag of Sucanat, which is free scratch sugar cane juice, uh, which should keep for at least 10 years. And I do use that so I can rotate it. And uh, I'm also looking to buy some more honey. Uh, I have some honey, but I'd like to have more because I like honey. It's a good food storage. I also purchased uh, real salt, which is the, the same salt that Nature Sunshine sells in the pink containers. Um, it's um, It comes from Redmond, Utah. And I ordered uh, a 25-pound bag of granulated real salt and a 25-pound bag of kosher real salt um, because I wanted to have plenty of salt. And I may actually order even more salt because as I'm learning how to use salt to preserve food, I want to make sure I have plenty of salt, not not, not just for myself and preserving food, but also maybe to, to trade with other people. So one of the things I hated about rotating food storage was that you'd get these plastic buckets and then you'd have to pry the lids off and then try to pound them back on. Well, now they have these really, really, really cool lids. Okay, and yes, they are $7 each, but to me, it's worth it. So you know, every one of these buckets, I, I bought the grains, um, like I say, from the health food store so I could get organically grown grains because that's what I want to eat, so that's what I want to rotate, right? So I, um, but I got these buckets. Uh, the buckets are anywhere from 4 to 6 or $7, depending on the size, and the lids are 7 bucks, six ninety five. What the lid is, is if you see that kind of uh, cross in the center, um, you can turn that and it spins out the center, and the outside is hammered onto the top of the bucket. So you never have to pry the lid open. You can just screw it off and then take out what you need and then screw it back on. Fantastic. So a lot of the emergency um, supply places now sell these buckets. They're awesome. It makes it really easy to rotate the food. Um, so what is important is when you do this, be sure to do something that I haven't been very good at in the past, but I am doing now well now, is label and date things. The dating is important so that uh, you can uh, 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 know what you've got to rotate through first, right? So, so that you know uh, what to eat first and what to eat next. Now, all right, so your space is limited. Um, back when I was about 12 or 14, um, I, I went, we went back east. Uh, I had, uh, uh, one of my cousins was, her husband was working, um, at a Senator's office in Washington, DC. So they were living in an apartment complex and they had food storage in their apartment. And what they did is they had used the buckets and stacked them for uh, like making end tables to put lamps on, and she just would dra draped over the buckets, so the buckets were kind of incorporated into various places in the house. Um, I, I have done that. I, this is actually a corner of my kitchen where I have a bunch of plants, and um, and I, I kind of pulled some things away from there, so you can, this is like, like plant nursery, but what is making the stand for the plants is basically uh, food storage buckets with an old sheet draped on them. And in the past, like when I had a, a storage room, I actually used the buckets for making the storage shelves. So I basically would put the stuff that was like the wheat that's going to last virtually forever and put that as like the, the uh, things to put the boards on to hold the shelves for the food storage. And I actually made the shelves out of food storage buckets and boards. But basically, you can put these in the closet or, you know, tuck them away here or there or whatever works for you depending on your living space. And having a little bit, of that is really good. Oh, here you can see I've, I've screwed off uh, the lid of one of these storage buckets. So you can see the, the contents inside. It's brown rice. Um, and I... I uh, you, but you want to make sure that you prevent insect infestation. I, I have had um, cupboard moths, pantry moths, get into some food and 
uh, while technically it's still edible, it's not very appetizing to find bugs crawling around in your food. So first of all, buy really, really well cleaned grains. Um, uh, one way to get the kill insects is if you live in a place that gets really cold in the winter, uh, set the buckets outside for a couple of weeks, you know, in in the freezing cold weather. Uh, that'll help to kill any insects. Uh, one little trick I learned uh, that's d different from nitrogen packing is get a little little chunk of dry ice and you put it in the bottom of the bucket, then you pour the food on top of it, and as the dry ice is melting, um, the, the, the carbon dioxide is heavier than the air, so you'll see the carbon dioxide come up over the top of the bucket, kind of boil over. When it stops boiling over, because the, because the dry ice melts, and as long as it's melting, it's still releasing gas, but as soon as it's the, the gas stops spilling over the sides of the bucket, you seal it. And that way, you've actually filled the bucket with carbon dioxide, which uh, has pushed most of the oxygen out, which actually helps to keep insects from growing in it. And another um, way to help prevent the insects from growing in is to basically um, put a few spoonfuls of diatomaceous earth in the bucket and then kind of roll it around to kind of mix the diatomaceous earth in with the grain. And diatomaceous earth is harmless to people, but it skewers insects. So if any insect eggs hatch or whatever, diatomaceous earth will kill them. Of course, if you buy stuff that's like, you know, pre-done pre in buckets from a food storage uh, place, um, they often will nitrogen pack it. Um, of course, once you open it and start rotating it, the, the nitrogen packing goes away. Now. What I this is a shot from my pantry. So what I do is I I go and I pull some of my beans or grains or whatever out of the big buckets and I take them and put them in these glass jars, which I got from Frontier Herbs many years ago. Um, I, I I really like them because they're they're glass and they're they're easy. You know, you see the food through them, and so basically I I put the things in here, and, and this is where I, I get my stuff from when I'm cooking. And then as soon as I run out in one of these jars, I go back to my food storage bucket, and I refill my small pantry jar and bring it into the pantry. Um, and that's how I rotate my food. And also that means I'm opening up my big buckets less often and using, you know, my putting the food into the smaller containers, which I'm opening uh, as I'm using it. It's really a good idea to store some fats and oils. The problem is they go rancid. So you can't really, if you're going to store any oils, you have to rotate them, rotate them, rotate them, rotate them. So you have to do like the kitchen pantry trick, like I said. I, I decided after thinking about this from a health perspective, that, okay, shortening is the one fat we'll store virtually forever, but it's probably the worst thing for your health that you could possibly have. So I don't want to eat it. So I don't like to store what I don't want to eat. And the partially hydrogenated vegetable oils, while storing better than natural oils, I don't want to eat them either. So I settled on, for my fats, uh, I found these like big containers of coconut oil at Costco, and that's a pretty stable fat that I can also that I use so I can rotate it. I also found uh, at the Indian grocer down in um, uh, Las Vegas, they had canned ghee, which is clarified butter, which actually has a fairly long shelf life. Of, of maybe a, a year or two. So I, when I open a container of ghee, I put it in the fridge uh, and use it for cooking. So I have, uh, I have ghee and coconut oil, and I also store some olive oil, which I, I, again, I'm rotating. So I have regularly like about three bottles of olive oil that I basically, when I use up one, I replace it, 
and a couple of bottles of safflower oil and a couple of containers of coconut oil and a couple of containers of ghee. But I'm rotating them uh, so that they won't go rancid and they'll still stay good. But they're the ones that I actually use. Okay, so many years ago, um, when I, I first married my wife of 14 years that I had four kids with, we moved to um, uh, Washington, to Spokane, Washington. And I had a, a and we fortunately got into a, a thing where I got a job as the manager of an apartment complex, which got me a, basically a free apartment, uh, or at least a, a it's a really discount apartment. And, but the money that I was expecting to be paid from the, the last job I'd working on was slow to follow us. And I, while I did rapidly find a job up there, um, you know, you, you, you're going to work for a couple of weeks before you get your first paycheck. So we didn't have very much money. Uh, and so we had some food storage. Uh, we actually had a case of chili. We had a bag of potatoes, and we had some wheat and uh, some honey and some stuff like that. And I'll tell you, the diet got pretty bland. I think we figured about every way there was to use canned chili that you could possibly imagine. Uh, and I and I figured out that if you're going to eat this stuff, if you've got like like what I've stored with beans and lentils and and grains, you got to figure out how to cook with it. Okay, which is Part of the reason I got into learning to to make certain things was trying to figure out how to cook and eat this stuff. But I figured out, figured rapidly, you need spices. So I, since that time, a big part of my food storage is I store herbs and spices so that I can basically, uh, and I've collected various ethnic cookbooks so that I can figure out ways to flavor things. Like I, I can, I make lentil burgers, which are basically uh, uh, smashed up cooked lentils with any kind of, of cracker crumbs or bread crumbs or rice or whatever I can use as a binder, and I season them with curry powder, I season them with Mexican seasoning, I season them, I can make them a bunch of different flavors. And I've tried making lentil meatloaf, and I've done a lot of things like that, and experimented with using spices. So, so to me, you want to have make sure you have some spices in your food storage, so so that you can make this thing. And also, uh, don't forget these. Make sure you have some baking powder. Make sure you have some baking soda, some kind of yeast, which I store in the freezer, um, some vinegar, and some condiments. Now, what I do with this is this is by the way how I rotate. It's time for me to buy some more jars of mayonnaise. But what I do is um, when I buy the, I'll, I'll buy a couple more jars of mayonnaise and I'll put the two jars to the back, pulling this the jar that you see forward. There's two bottles of ketchup there, the salad dressings, the tartar sauce, the mustard, everything. I basically have it organized on the shelf, so I pull it forward and put the new ones to the back, and that's how I rotate it. But that way I always have, like, you know, I've got canned tuna fish in my food storage, and so having some mayonnaise is nice, and I think you're having some condiments is nice if you, to make it eat it. I don't, I don't keep a year's supply of condiments, but it's part of what I think of as my, you know, maybe month's worth or a couple of months' worth of, of stuff. I, I do store some canned goods. Um, I, I look for uh, cases of stuff at Costco or... Or um, or the local grocery stores has a case lot sale uh, uh, once or twice a year, and I the things that I tend to buy in bulk are canned tomatoes, because I find that tomatoes uh, are one of the things that help you cook up those different beans and legumes and everything and make them tasty. Plus, I like to use tomatoes and tomato sauce in a lot of dishes. Um, I also keep tuna fish, sardines, and some canned meat products uh, on hand. I also keep chili on hand, of some canned soups and stews, uh, which are part of that easy-to-eat stuff. And I don't eat those all the time, but you know, a lot of times I, I, after I've done a webinar or whatever, and I come home and I'm, it's late and I don't want to do anything, open a can of soup or something.
or some canned beans. So you can, uh, whatever you're, if you're eating these kind of foods, then you can buy a case of them and then rotate it, you know, so that you're, you have some of these things on hand. Sure makes the basic staples a little more uh, thick. Also, um, you saw my jars in the pantry. I also have things like nuts and dried fruits and uh, natural flours, like I have brown rice flour and gluten-free flour and coconut flour and, and whole grain pasta and stuff like that. And I do store them all in either glass jars or, or I some of the – when I get a, any kind of a bigger plastic container, I also tend to save those as food storage containers. And I also – for my nuts, what I do is I buy my nuts in bulk. So these, this is there's a, the big plastic bag you see at the back, is the bag I have my walnuts in in the freezer. So I pulled them out so you can see. And so what I do is I keep the nuts in the freezer so they won't go rancid. And then I have a, a jar in my pantry of the nuts so that I can eat from those. And then when I need to replenish them, I go to the freezer and I pull out the nuts. It's the same thing as like with the food storage buckets. So it's a way of of rotating what I'm storing. And that way I can buy nuts when they're in season on sale and I can keep them in the freezer. This is some information on shelf life that I got. Uh, food, well-stored food will actually be edible beyond these dates. It's just, it may not be as nutritious beyond these dates. So I've already indicated that most grains with the exception of brown rice um, if you've got them in a nice, well-sealed container and you're keeping them in a, a cool, dark place, will last for 10 to 12 years. Uh, quinoa will last for 20 years, and I'm pretty sure amaranth is probably very similar because they're both closely related plants. White rice will store for about 10 years, but brown rice only stores about one to two years. Um, dried beans, this is one of the reasons why I... I I, since I like lentils and I like split peas and I actually will eat them, whereas I wouldn't eat powdered milk, I basically th thought those are good options because they last 30 years and they've got protein and, um, and so forth. Uh, brown sugar lasts 10 years. So my sucanat, that's good for about 10 years. Plus, when I bought a 50-pound bag of sucanat, the price was half of what I normally pay for a bag, of, a one pound bag of sucanat. So I thought that was pretty cool because in the long run, I'm actually saving money on that. Um, dry milk will last for 25 years. Uh, cooking oil, see this is where the problem is. Cooking oils only last about six months. So you really can't store a year's supply of cooking oils. You can only store about a three to six months supply and rotate through it. Um, canned goods will store two to five years until they're opened, and of course then they only last a few days in the fridge. And dehydrated foods will last 25 years. Um, the, the biggest problem I see with dehydrated foods are, one, I mean, you, you've got to have a lot of water to rehydrate them. They're hard to cook, and I don't necessarily want to rotate them. Um, although, like I said, I do have a few um, cans of a few things like that. Now, I mentioned caches. So I, uh, so the, the caches uh, are basically hiding food. So David and I last year put out two caches. Uh, We've been meaning to go – we actually meant to dig them up six months later. It's been over a year, and we need to go dig them up. One of them, actually, there was a fire that went over that area, so I'm really interested to see how the cash came out. But what we did is we uh, took uh, one of these little plastic containers, just like you see here. Um, this is one that we haven't uh, gone and buried yet. <laughs> And we buried these. I mean, so we we were tr we were, were trying to experiment with how well we could preserve some food um, that you know you could dig up later. So anyway, um, we we put these little plastic tubs with tight fitting lids uh, and filled it full of some food plus a couple of things to start uh, 
fire starters and stuff like that. We we sealed the lid, and then what we did is we put it in a big uh, trash bag, and uh, you know black big trash bag, uh, and taped it with duct tape all around so that the trash bag is completely you know sealed around the container. So so it was also sealed with an extra layer of plastic, and then we buried them. So we got to see how they they turned out, um, but. You could make caches inside of your house somewhere, you know. Um, you know, just think of some places where people would not likely look for the food, and keep you know some of your food where people would see it, but some of it where they might not see it, and basically uh, store some. If you've got a place that you could try doing what we're doing, which is to bury some. Uh, <laughs> By the way, the, the both of our caches are actually quite a distance from our house. It, it's we almost uh, we're, we're setting them up like if you had to to flee, you know, in one direction or the other, you'd have a cache to go dig up. But uh, I don't know. It was an experiment. I'm 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 I got to see how it turned out. Okay, so that's your basic uh, uh, the. Um, thing which is the phase three is developing food self-reliance now what this means is you know not being dependent on the system don't don't right now it's so easy for us to just go buy food from the grocery store but what happens if it isn't easy to go buy food from the grocery store anymore um, what are you going to do how are you going to uh, find ways to get inexpensive food, how are you going to preserve it, how are you going to, you know, take care of people. So the phase three goal is knowing how to find, produce, or preserve food for yourself. And this is to develop self-reliant skills when it comes to food so you're less dependent on the local grocery store. So we're going to cover some learning about some ways to preserve food, about the importance of a garden, about a little bit about edible wild plants and hunting and trapping animals for food. So I happen to love canning. Um, so this is, you know, some of the, this is some of my canned goods. I, I think it's fun to can. I have a blast with canning. So when different foods are in season, I will buy like uh, my I grew up with doing this. My mom would go buy cases when when peaches and pears and everything were in season in the fall. She'd go buy cases of peaches and pears and we'd sit and bottle them and put them away in the basement to eat during winter time uh or make jams or bottle tomatoes or whatever. So um what I love to do is is I'll you know, put on a movie or, or turn on Turner Classic Movies or something like that, and I will sit uh, in my family room kind of watching the movie while I chop up, cut up stuff to, to, to can. So I do, uh, uh, I, I don't, I still haven't been able to get a good truck crop of tomatoes where I grow. I get lots of peppers, and I'm really getting good at cucumbers. So I make cucumber relish, and I, I made ketchup this year. I, it was a first, my first year making my own homemade ketchup. I make salsa. My family and everybody loves salsa, so I make different kinds of salsa. In you know, I, I the pickle, the peppers from my garden, and and so forth. Um, all of your um, high acid foods, which is pretty much your fruits or anything you're pickling. Um, and also tomatoes, uh, if they're not low acid tomatoes, uh, if you're bottling tomatoes in a water bath canner, you might want to add just a little bit of vinegar to make sure that the acid is high enough. But basically all of those can be done in a water bath or a steam canner. I use a steam canner. I like the steam canner better than the water bath canner. Um, but basically they're just processed at boiling a boiling temperature. Um, just uh, Two years ago, uh, Christmas, uh, one of my sons bought me a, my first pressure canner. Yay! So I have uh, uh, done a little bit of pressure canning. I decided to try pressure canning some pinto beans to basically for making refried beans, which we've been eating. And I also 
uh, saw a uh, organic corn corned beef on sale last March around the uh, um, around St. Patrick's Day. So I bought two of them. I cut them up and I pressure canned my own meat. And I actually uh, opened one up and made corned beef hash out of it. And it was yummy. It was beautiful. So I'm going to be doing more with like canning my own meat, um, which uh, I think is a, a nice thing. It's a little bit scary, you know, because the with the pressure canner, but I'm getting more comfortable with it. One of the oldest ways of uh, preserving food is dehydration. Um, you don't have to have electricity to dehydrate things. I, I do have an electric dehydrator, but I've dehydrated foods using um, uh, making a frame with window screen. Uh, and you basically put the food on the on one window screen and you cover it with another window screen and you just put it out in the sun. So the window screens protect it from the insects and then basically the food will dry. Um, and then you want to take and store the dehydrated food in sealed containers. So these are some peppers. They're actually uh, the kind of peppers that you use to make uh, uh, paprika. So I, I had a, a couple of these plants, and they produced very prolifically. So this is about one-third of what I got, and I'm still drying a lot of them. Um, and I plan to, when they're all dry, to basically pulverize them into my own paprika. I, I also like freezing. The, the problem with freezing, of course, is that while it's a good self-sufficient thing to do, it's not necessarily the best for emergency preparedness because if the power goes out, your frozen food can go bad in like three to four days, um, which uh, what I'm thinking is if if there's still some way to cook, I like all the meat and anything in my freezer, I would like pull out and start cooking uh, or doing something else to try to preserve it. Um, if the power went out, but it is a nice way to preserve things. And I, um, I grew uh, these yellow green beans in my garden, and they're they're quite easy to freeze. You uh, blanch them, you which is basically you drop them into a pot of boiling water for a few minutes, then you drain them and just. I throw things on cookie sheets that have lid, you know, uh, rims around the side let it freeze individually and then stuff it into bags the next morning. Um, I also, I, I just, I have tons of green peppers. I, uh, and I found last year that they freeze quite well without blanching and they are a lot more tasty than the green peppers at the store even after they've been frozen because I basically go out and pick them and they're all fresh and, and I cut them up and I spread them on cookie sheets and let them dry and then so forth. I also find cheese on sale and uh, meat and butter, and I, I freeze all of those. And the secret to freezing the cheese I found was um, if you pull the cheese out of the freezer and let it uh, put it on the countertop and wait until it warms up to room temperature, it isn't crumbly. It basically gets back to the to the same consistency it had before you froze it. If you put it from the freezer to the fridge, the cheese gets crumbly. So I, that was a little trick I learned. But I also store butter. I wrap the butter in aluminum foil and then put it in plastic bags. I also freeze fruit because I love to make fruit smoothies for breakfast. So whatever I find fruits in season, like when strawberries are in season or I can find raspberries or I find peaches, I basically uh, cut up the fruit and I put it on the cookie sheet and then I let it freeze overnight and then I transfer it into the plastic bags. I put smaller plastic bags inside of the bigger plastic bags and then I, I label, I date it so I know what it was. Um, and basically, uh, so I, I keep quite a bit of frozen fruit. I'm having fun with fermentation and I'm learning how to do fermentation because I realized that this actually would be an awesome way to preserve food in an emergency. Like, okay, I, I have um, uh, the 
because what happens is if you if you ferment food, it produces its own acid, which means that you could can it uh, just without having any vinegar to pickle it. Um, the only way to store some of the stuff long term would be to uh, to can it, but if you even just ferment food and you had a like really cool dark place, uh, things like sauerkraut and everything, you could it'll it'll keep for two or three weeks as long as it's in a cool place because it basically creates its own acid to ferment things. So this is a, an experiment I'm doing. I uh, I had a whole bunch of hot peppers from my garden, plus some random like odd uh, bits of of uh, some carrots were kind of like a little bit deformed. Anyway, I shoved them all into the fermentation jar with some whey and some salt, and I'm actually trying to make my own like Tabasco sauce. <laughs> I plan to ferment it for a month, and then uh, I, I'll take and run the whole thing through the blender and then cook it down and squeeze it through some cheesecloth and bottle it. So that's my plan. We'll see how it turns out anyway. Uh, of course, not everyone has uh, the space to grow a garden, um, but I I like to garden. I, for one thing, I'm less and less trusting our food supply. Uh, all the GMOs and all the chemicals that are used in our modern agriculture really bother me, and so I buy heirloom seeds. The heirloom seeds are seeds that will will you know, grow true to form, and that, which means you can save seeds and replant. Like um, last year, I had one a particular cucumber that were, produced really well, so I let one of them get really huge, and I uh, took the seeds out, saved them, replanted them, and that cucumber, those cucumbers produced really well for me again. So I, I, I got another, let another one of them get huge, which I'm about to cut up and save the seeds from it that replant I've I, I've done a few other things that I've basically um, you know I'm experimenting with saving seeds and so forth but even if you don't have space for a garden I'd get some seeds uh, you can get seeds that are packed in a in a in a can so they're sealed so they'll last for a while because that could be really valuable I mean in an emergency who wants a lawn I mean, tear up your lawn and plant a garden, you know? I mean, uh, and, and, and if things got bad enough, you know, you'd, be, you'd probably find a, a, a garden, vegetable garden, much nicer than a lawn. Um, and plus, you get to, like, do what I do, which is, like, can some of your own food, which to me, I just, I, my garden is still producing. Um, I, I'm, I still am experimenting with what grows best where I live, but peppers seem to do really well. I just went out and picked a whole bunch more of green peppers and a few hot peppers in my garden this morning, and as well as I've still got a few tomatoes. Um, and when the when it looks like it's going to freeze, what I'll do is I'll go pull up the tomato vines with whatever green tomatoes on there are on there, and uh, basically I can either put them in a in a place in my house with the the green tomatoes attached to part of the vine or or hang them up uh, now that I've got a little greenhouse I can maybe hang some up up in the greenhouse but as long as they're kept warm and you, and you keep them attached to part of the vine I've had tomatoes uh, clear into December that ripened uh, on the the dead vines um, from the tomato plants so that's kind of cool um, now foraging You know, um, it's probably, a, like I said on the last one I did where, you know, learning about some of the medicinal plants in your area, it's really smart to not only learn some of the, you know, what plants in your area are edible, but actually figure out where some of them are growing. Like, I know where there's some cattail stands. I know where there are some, you know, various places where there are some edible wild plants growing. Um, I, I know a lot about edible plants. I think that it's smart while you aren't starving to try eating some uh, because 
you'll figure out what's palatable and what's tasty and kind of how to cook it and or prepare it when you're not starving. I mean, like I um, there's these thistles and I know thistles are edible, and I dug them up and I uh, tried cooking them, and they they do have a little bit of a reminiscence of artichoke, but they were kind of bitter. And so if I ever do it again, I need to put more salt in the water because salt will help to pull out the bitterness and maybe boil them a couple of times. Um, some plants are, are pretty tasty as they are. Other plants require ways of trying to figure out how to eat them. Uh, cattails are one, are one of my favorites. They're pretty yummy. So if you've got a cattail marsh anywhere nearby where you live, kind of keep note of that because that's a really good source of, of food. I'm not going to take time tonight to try to tell, tell about edible wild plants because I have no idea what part of the country you're in or what's growing in your locale. I've never hunted before, but uh, a year ago, last fall, the uh, fall of 2012, I had a spiritual impression to go get a rifle and uh, some ammunition for hunting. And so I did, and that was right before there was a run on the guns and ammunition, and all of the guns and ammunition virtually dis started disappearing you know, from the stores because of the panic over what the government was doing, which I thought was, again, that thing of being able to get spiritual guidance. Um, it, knowing how to hunt and trap and butcher animals could be valuable survival skill, but it depends on where you're at. I mean, obviously, live in the middle of a city, that's not going to be very practical, except for the fact that you can trap rodents. I know that sounds disgusting, but if you're starving, uh, well, well, you know, rather rather eat a, a rat or a mouse than, you know, starve. Uh, and insects can also be a viable source of food, uh, like things like um, crickets and grasshoppers and stuff are actually quite edible. Uh, but you've got to you know do a little research and study study about that um i happen to live kind of out of town uh i so i figured there are kind of wild rabbits around that would be a good good thing to hunt uh and occasionally there are deer coming down where we live or there's more deer up towards the mountains so if at least if you had some way to to shoot you know an animal to for food that would be good if you've got some some ammo. I I am not. This is the area of primitive survival skills. I'm probably one of the weakest in, is um, hunting and trapping. Uh, but I happen to live in an area where there are quite a few people who do know how to do that. So uh, if there's an emergency, I may be learning a lot from them. So, uh, someone said that the charts on the web page. So I'm assuming that what you're saying is that the charts uh, that in the handouts that it's too small, so everything compressed and became jumbles. I'll, if that's the case, I'll double check that. I'll I'll get those charts and I'll upload them um, separately. Um, someone also mentioned besides the real salt, the Himalayan salt, uh, you can buy in bulk from San Francisco Salt Company. Yeah, and that's a that's a really nice salt too. Uh, there's also a Celtic salt. Um, again, I've taken a little different approach to this from most people because, like I said, if you're going to eat, if you're going to store what you eat and eat what you store, then it's pretty smart to basically, uh, <laughs> you know, I I want to eat organic grains, so I'm buying organic grains for my food storage. I don't, you know, I'm or buying organic beans. I'm I'm buying things that I would actually want to eat that I think would be more nutritious. Um, someone uh, point, points out a really important thing. Uh, the best foods to store for people with type O blood, because beans and grains are really horrible for the digestive system. Actually, um, beans and grains, eating a lot of beans and grains is not good for most anybody's digestive system. Um, one of the things that you want to, of course, do is is to soak them before you cook them and eat them. But we're not talking about you know optimal conditions. We're talking about survival conditions, and because they are um, this, these are like 
emergency staple foods. They're there to keep you from starving. Um, basically, as far as the way of life kind of thing, um, what you need to do is is store canned meats um, of various sorts. Uh, either get a pressure canner and can your own or basically buy things like canned tuna fish and canned sardines and so forth and rotate through them. Um, someone did mention that if you've got some land, you can basically have some animals like some chickens or rabbits or whatever, which is the ideal thing for a, you know a, someone who needs a higher uh, protein. Uh, and then someone suggested uh, setting up a, uh, whoops, um, setting up a decoy of some of the older food storage for the police or thieves to take, make it look like it's a real thing, and then keep your main food visible. They're, since they suggested you check YouTube for ideas, and I, I would say that's a good idea too. I mean. One of the reasons why I'm storing things like amaranth and quinoa and everything is because I figure uh, people who are, are hunting for food are not necessarily going to know how to cook or eat that stuff. Um, someone said uh, dehydrate to store is a great DIY website for information on dehydrating food. Uh, gluten sensitive people may look into using natural or wild yeast. Um, and yeah, and that's also true. I have read that um, that if you um, do the sourdough, like if you use the wild yeast and you do the sourdough on the bread, that that actually uh, alters the gluten so you don't have the gluten sensitivity. Um, and I learned from a friend of mine in the local area that um, the juniper berries that grow around here you'll you'll see this like powder blue uh thing on the juniper berries that's wild ye yeast growing on the juniper berries so if you have like berry these any kind of berries that basically get a kind of powdery blue film on them that's wild yeast and you can basically um put some of those juniper berries into a little starter of flour and water and get a yeast start going. And that's what the pioneers did. So that was a really cool thing I learned. Um, and uh, that, uh, and if you do a sourdough, you're going to have less problems with digesting the, the, the gluten in the grains. So I said, I buy a 50 pound bag of Redmond cattle salt for the cows. It's a coarser ground, but works well in soups or stews. Then I can uh, can the the beef. Uh, the processor uh, will cut it into chunks. Yeah, um, I I've been kind of like a little scared of canning meat, but one of the massage therapists at the massage envy place I go to, she hunts and she cans her own meat. She was telling me how easy it is, and I thought, okay, I got to try this. So I I actually decided to try canning meat and. Um, with a pressure canner, and it actually is really yummy. Um, it's very tender, uh, so if you get, you could get um, uh, uh, a really good quality of, uh, you know, uh, uh, meat, you know, lamb or, or beef or whatever, and do your own home pressure canning. And again, um, right, one of the reasons why I do these things is, is because I've, my whole life, I've never trusted the system. I've never wanted to be totally dependent on the system. I've wanted to learn these things. And I figure even now, while I could go and get basically anything I want from the store, it's nice to practice now while my life doesn't depend on it so that when my life does depend on it, I basically uh, will have the skills already that will help me be able to do things like this. Someone said all commercial yeasts are GMO, genetically modified. I, I had never heard that, but um, I do know that uh, I got a book on sourdough breads and some places to get a sourdough starter, and I I would like to get a sourdough starter. I used to have a sourdough starter, and I 
kept it in the fridge, and I would make sourdough pancakes and some sourdough bread now and then, so forth and so forth. Uh, someone suggested do a search for Wendy DeWitt on YouTube, and she has an excellent explanation of cooking meat and canning meat and preparing food for storage. She's amazing. Thank you. That's great. Um, I mean, obviously, you can find a lot of information on the Internet. There's a lot of great books out there. I kind of took this from, you know, sharing kind of my personal, you know, take on this. Um, I've read, you know, various books on survival and things over the years and, and whatnot. And, but I do really believe that right now it's very critical to start at least getting some food storage put away and uh, some uh, supplies and things on hand because I do think we're going to have some civil unrest. And if you live in a major metropolitan area, I definitely would make sure that you have some kind of uh, bug out kit uh, so that if you had to flee, you would have some supplies to take with you to help help you survive. Um, so someone says they can't remember how, but you can use potato water and make your own sourdough starter. I, I, I know that there are some directions for making sourdough starters, but basically, Besides doing sourdough, the other thing you can do with the grains is you can partially sprout them and make a seen bread. So what that is, is you, um, you take and sprout the wheat or the other grains until the roots are about one to one and a half the length of the seed, and at that point, all the starches have been converted into sugars. All of the things which basically um, uh, which basically inhibit uh, nutrient absorption are gone. The amount of vitamins and minerals has upped in the plant because it's become the seed because it's become bioactive. And then you basically run the the sprouted. Uh, lightly sprouted seeds through a hand meat grinder to crush them up and you can add nuts and dried fruits and you can pack them into cakes and you can uh, uh, basically dehydrate them so that you're basically getting raw food. Um, you can basically cook them in the hot sun or you can put them in a dehydrator. You can also cook them at a low temperature uh, uh, oven. Um, and uh, basically uh, make your own bread. And yes, you could make a seen bread with non-gluten grains. You could, uh, assuming that you've got the whole seed. Now, like, for example, millet is usually, um, the husk has been removed, so it wouldn't sprout. But um, it's, you probably, I don't know how amaranth or quinoa would do. Uh, if you get a good quality oat groats, it shouldn't have gluten in it. You could probably do it with oats, but anyway, I'd I'd have I'd have to experiment with it. I've I've only done it with um, um, wheat and spelt and stuff like that. Um, and you can also, as someone mentioned, uh, is to get sprouting seeds and some sprout seeds to sprout, because if you've got some like uh, mung bean seeds and some broccoli seeds and and red clover seeds, alfalfa seeds, etc. You can basically uh, that makes a very compact amount of thing to store, but you can basically sprout them and create your own vegetables, so that you are getting some fresh, live, nutrient-rich food um, in an emergency situation. So, like I said, I think if you're starving to death, you know you you, you want to, you're going to want to eat anything that you can eat, you know, uh, you're not going to be too picky. Um, and, but if you can supplement your food with some things that are fresh, either by foraging for wild greens or by doing sprouts, that will really, uh, help. Someone asked if I could post my recipe for lentil burgers. Uh, I, yeah, I think I could. I just, just quickly, all I do is cook lentils until they're tender, and then I uh, I add whatever 
I either add like leftover rice or I add um, some kind of bread or cracker crumbs and uh, basically to make to, to, to they make the lentils so that they will firm up into patties and then I just season them with something. I, I, I season them with curry powder, I season them with, uh, uh, what is it called, um, Mexican seasoning. Uh, I've seasoned them with just a variety of things, and I just um, put a little oil on the bottom of a pan and uh, cook them till they're kind of a little bit fried on one side and flip them over. That's that's it. They're very simple. Um, I actually invented the recipe one day when I was cooking some lentils, and I got called away, and so I I turned the stove off and left. The lentils were almost done. I, I, but I left them in the pot, and then I came back to them. They had basically the heat from the pot had cooked them till they were kind of all mushy. And I thought, what am I going to do with this? So I decided to. I, I actually th had some leftover rice, I or something like that. I threw it in there, put some seasoning, and I fried them, and they were really yummy. And my kids loved them, and so forth, and they were really easy to make. So. Uh, like I say, the the way to figure out how to cook and eat this stuff is to get some good vegetarian cookbooks or cookbooks that talk about how to cook with these kind of things, and then you can start experimenting with it because it's not going to do you much good if you don't know how to eat it. And since you know I've been storing food all along, and I know the importance of rotating it, that's why I started to try to find ways of experimenting of how to prepare it and eat it as well as you know so forth. So I hope this has been useful to everyone. Um, thank you for being patient with me. I had a lot of travel in the last five weeks, and uh, uh, so I really couldn't get to this, you know, until now. But um, I, uh, I, we have two more uh, webinars in this series, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the other things besides food in terms of of survival skills and emergency pre you know preparation skills and then probably starting in January I'm going to actually do a series and I'm going to go in and, uh, and just discuss the prophecies of Isaiah and uh, just go through a lot of the book of Isaiah and so forth in in a series and also Gar my friend Gary told me last night that he got a call from um, uh, one of his friends in the military, a very an admiral, I believe, in the Navy, who basically word has come down in the military that uh, uh, Christians are to be considered potential terrorists and a threat to our government. He was very, very concerned about that, so he's going to talk about that on our Love and Prayer Hour webinar tomorrow night, uh, which is rather late, but um, you know, I, I think that the time is coming when in the United States we, we are not going to be uh, quite having the blessings that we've had for a long time, and we're going to go through a little bit of a tough period. But I think that, um, you know, I believe very firmly that God is on our side if we, if we repent and seek him, and that um, uh, whatever the trials or tribulations that might come upon us, will only work for our good if we, you know, are prayerful and, and diligent. But I, I, I do think that uh, our government is basically going out of control, and there are a lot of other countries where, um, you know, Christians have been persecuted and, and Bibles confiscated and things like that. And I, I think that we're going to see some of that in this country, sadly enough. But uh, we, that's part of the reason why we're discussing this. The the webinar on Monday night is at is at nine thirty Mountain Time, which is eleven thirty Eastern Time and eight thirty Pacific Time. I don't know why Gary wants to have it so late. He's on the East Coast, so he's it's eleven thirty for him. We it's for one hour, and uh, but uh, uh, he wants to share with you know a little bit about what he's been hearing because it's got him uh, quite concerned. Anyway. Um, so I thought I'd just mention that uh, to all of you. Thanks, everybody, for participating tonight. Thank you all for supporting me in, in 
doing this. I, I appreciate the opportunity to share things I've learned about, uh, you know, what I see happening with prophecy and about how to be prepared for it. So God bless you all, uh, and hope that you'll all be able to, you know, make preparations to be ready for the things that are coming. So good night.